Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, I want to begin by saying thank you to AMI for the invitation today. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to be able to present my work uh, at a distinguished academic forum such as this, where people can engage with my ideas in a serious and scholarly fashion. Uh, and thank you so much to Adam and all of the faculty for all of your hospitality today. Uh, so with that, I'll begin my talk. Um, <clears throat> in After Virtue, Alistair McIntyre writes uh, famously that the new dark ages are already upon us. Uh, this time, however, the barbarians are not waiting at the frontiers. They have already been governing us for quite some time. McIntyre's forceful argument uh, in favor of restoring the Aristotelian tradition of virtue ethics in the modern political system and his analysis of what has been lost with the advent of modernity have fundamentally reshaped the state of contemporary moral and political philosophy in the West. In McIntyre's telling, we are using the same rhetoric of morality as ancient moral philosophers. <clears throat> but modernity has caused us to strip such discourse of its essential historical context. Because McIntyre believes that mankind has undergone a fundamental rupture in conceptions of the self and society, relegating the historical context of the rhetoric of morality to utter irrelevance poses a significant problem. Moral consensus in the modern age is impossible because individuals disagree on even baseline assumptions. This was not the case in the past, where even though people disagreed on how to pursue the good life, there was a consensus that the good life was connected to what was best for society. Who exactly are these barbarians that are governing us? We live in a world where the Western neoliberal economic and political project is considered sacrosanct. The Western system of governance is deemed so superior by certain players that it warrants intervention into the affairs of other countries, even if that means war and utter destruction. McIntyre's argument is powerful because it challenges the arrogance of the presupposition that Western moral and political frameworks adequately exemplify the highest ethical ideals. In fact, McIntyre suggests that under modern conditions, it is impossible that any ideals are being followed or adhered to in a systematic manner. This is because, as Wa'il Halak, a prominent Western scholar of Islamic law, has astutely observed, central to modern philosophy is the question of why be moral, a question that presupposes a particular state of affairs in which consciousness of the moral as a distinct, distinctive, and integral category takes center stage and where the moral is not to be taken as a matter of course. This is part of the genealogy that McIntyre also draws our attention to. Morality today has been relegated to a private concept, whereas in ancient society, it was part of the public fabric of society. The extent to which this vision of a polis governing individual behavior existed can be debated, but it is by and large a strongly defensible position that prior to the Enlightenment, morality was not a concept that was disconnected from tradition and society. In the pre-modern Islamic context, Halak claims that it was the common understanding that the Sharia constitutes the path to the good life, a path that claimed to guarantee well-being in this world and in the hereafter, since the implication, which remains no more than that, that morality come law possesses a teleology whose very fulfillment is their own raison d'etre. I think that's how you pronounce it. Halak undoubtedly espouses an overly generous view of pre-modern Islamic societies and fails to acknowledge that the Sharia that he speaks of did not transcend the political and legal realities of governing an empire. But his perspective is a starting point for my own paper. I take seriously the contention that we are living in a world where we pay lip service to morality, but have all but abandoned the sociological backdrop 
necessary to pursue the good life. My project in this paper is to explore the work of another giant of modern philosophy, who shared many of McIntyre's insights, but preceded him by about two decades and wrote for an Arabic-speaking audience. At the age of 24, Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, who would go on to become one of the most intellectually productive clerics in the history of Shiism before his assassination by Saddam, wrote Falsafatuna, or Our Philosophy. <clears throat> For those who don't know, a brief biography of Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr is in order. Al-Sadr was assassinated at age 40. At the, end, at the time when al-Sadr was writing, the ideology of communism was thre threatening to capture a large segment of Shiite followers in Iraq. Because of a majority of Iraq's population at the time was extremely poor, the classless society propagated by communist leaders appealed to them immensely. In fact, communism was so popular that many of the relatives of prominent clerics joined the communist ranks. Whether the clerics themselves saw communism as a direct threat to their control over the people or as an anti-religious dogma, the religious leaders of Iraq, Sunni and Shia alike, fervently opposed communism. A Southern's tract is a powerful argument against modernity and Western philosophy, especially capitalism and communism. Like McIntyre, he too engages deeply with the Western philosophical tradition, including the works of Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Locke, Hume, Kant, William James, Hegel, Marx, and Freud. A Southern believed that morality has been stripped of any role in the modern political order. <clears throat> I want to put a Southern into conversation with McIntyre because both thinkers believe that a return to the Aristotelian tradition is necessary for establishing justice for humanity. Both are also highly critical of modernity, although the analytical lens of each differs slightly. McIntyre views the modern world as the embodiment of Nietzschean thought, whereas a Southern engages more deeply with the work of empiricists and Marxists to make sense of where we are and how we got here. The two philosophers also differ in that a Southern believes religion is the best way to capture the Aristotelian spirit, whereas McIntyre, despite his lauding of the religious tradition, is not so explicit in his argument. It is for this reason that I believe it is, ex it is fruitful to explore the work of, of a Southern in conjunction with that of McIntyre. A Southern's work is especially noteworthy because he actively worked to establish what he wrote about. In 1958, a Southern was involved with the founding of the Ad Da'wah Party, an underground organization formed in response to the communist mood taking hold of the country, and which later attracted many anti Ba'athists after the Ba'ath Party rose to power in 1968. The explicit objective of the Ad Da'wah Party was to organize dedicated Muslim believers with the goal of seizing power and establishing an Islamic state. As I will detail further, a Southern believed that Islam offered the solution to many of the problems that were unsolvable by capitalism and communism. The two dominant political philosophies during the time at which he was writing. His proposal is sparse on practical details, but the argument is interesting for us because he engages directly with an Aristotelian version of ethics. One strong counter-argument to this thesis is posed by Wael Halak, who has stated that any conception of a modern Islamic state is inherently self-contradictory because of the very design of the modern state and the modern project. In the Islamic world, where the impact of colonialism continues to linger and hamper the development of robust political and economic institutions, the role of tradition in governance is very much a subject of debate. The onset of the Arab Spring was a ready-made case study for the effectiveness of a return to tradition through liberal, democratic, political principles and institutions. Halak's view has a lot of merit, <clears throat> since the effort to return to such tradition was an abject failure, as demonstrated by the experience of certain Middle Eastern countries. Take, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood, 
a group that had been persecuted for decades, which tried to force the population to accept Islamic legislation and then was ultimately overthrown by the army, which was supported by popular protests. I view the work of Asadr differently, however, because secularists in Iraq, whether in the form of U.S.-backed Ba'athists or Soviet-backed communists, were committing such extreme acts of suppression and violence that any covert action against them, whether or not the ultimate aim was to establish an Islamic state, should be considered the type of resistance against Nietzschean nihilism that McIntyre deems necessary. That is to say, I agree on a high level with Halak's instinct that an Islamic state is problematic, and this has been proven to be the case by the experience of recent history. But in a world where the options are limited, the mere expression of the desire to overthrow existing hierarchies, even if the theoretical options would, necessarily, would not necessarily create a perfect result in practice, should be taken seriously. Thus, I think understanding the work of Bakana Sadr is indispensable and perhaps the only way to bring McIntyre's life's work to fruition. What modernity tore asunder in our collective sense of self has been replaced by various politics of identity, be it nationalism, racism, or ethnocentrism. Religious identity has also been used in the interests of tyranny, but religion is arguably the only ideology that has the potential to take virtue seriously. Even though, to use McIntyre's metaphor, what we have today are mere remnants of a full-fledged discourse. In the words of one prominent scholar, what is at stake is first of all to determine the status of ethics in the lives of societies and individuals. As uh, are, sorry, what is at stake is first of all to determine the status of ethics in the lives of societies and individuals. Are our respective ethics no more than a body of principles that we must protect away from the world? Or are they references through which we try to live coherently in our private and public lives? So, putting McIntyre and Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr into conversation. It has become particularly fashionable among modern Muslim reformists to speak of an Islamic system that prioritizes the higher objectives of the law in order to conform Islamic positions with modern conceptions of human rights, with modern conceptions of human rights. Instead of rejecting the paradigm of modernity, these reformists have co-opted it. Perhaps the most elegant proponent of this view, with a perspective that fails to challenge the legitimacy uh, of presuppositions of modern moral, moral values, is Abdullah and Naim a distinguished professor of law at Emory University. In his Islam and the Secular State, uh, Naeem writes that, quote, As a Muslim, I need a secular state in order to live in accordance with Sharia, out of my own genuine conviction and free choice, personally and in community with other Muslims. End quote. His argument is twofold. One, that the modern state as it exists, uh, sorry, that the modern state exists as it is, and thus Muslims should accept it and work within it. And two, a secular state is non-ideological and thereby provides individuals with the flexibility to believe as they wish, thereby fulfilling one of the purposes of the Sharia, that is to say, belief in religion without compulsion. And Naim's is an argument that is surprising for its treatment of secularism. Far from being non-ideological, secularism is in fact a very particular way of looking at the world. In privileging civic reason, the state is automatically deprioritizing other values. Halak offers a much more sophisticated critique of the modern project one that draws heavily from McIntyre. He notes that the modern state comes with its own arsenal of metaphysics and much else. In contradistinction to this, he dreams of the pre-modern Islamic system, or a paradig where a paradigmatic uh, 
moral, legal, ethic reigned supreme. This too is a fiction, as pre-modern forms of governance were beset with their own problems. The care for its citizens that Halak imagines was present in the pre-modern system uh, is easily disproved by a cursory examination of the historical record. And yet there is something to be said about the role of religion in inspiring virtue. To this end, I believe that examining the work of a Sadr is critical because he has put forth a sophisticated philosophical argument for such a system. A Sadr begins his book by critiquing the capitalism of the West. He states that capitalistic democracy is based on unlimited confidence in the individual and in the fact that the individual's personal interests naturally ensure the interests of society in various areas. The idea of a society that governs the role of the individual has been completely flipped. Instead, it is now the flourishing of the individual that is deemed to be indicative of societal flourishing. Under this system, a good state is that organization that can be used for the service and for the sake of the individual. And that is a strong instrument for protecting his interests. McIntyre labels this state of affairs emotivism. That is to say, all moral judgments are nothing but expressions of preference, expressions of attitude or feeling, insofar as they are moral or evaluative in character. Such a way of appreciating morality, McIntyre notes, leads to a society where there is no moral consensus and thus social relations become a matter of using each other as a means to fulfill personal agendas. A Southern is dismissive of the notion that serving the individual is actually a way to serve society. A Southern's ultimate solution of an Islamic state tries to proactively counteract many of these tendencies. A Southern does not label our current way of navigating the world as emotivism. But his notion of a unified religious perspective certainly recognizes the problem of a society where moral values end up being expressions of arbitrary choices made by the individual. Both McIntyre and Al-Sadr believe that a system of morality must be anchored to a structure and a tradition that serves as a guidepost. Building on his critique of the placing of the individual before society, a Southern notes that the flourishing of the individual has no further discernible purpose or telos. He states that capitalism is a philosophy which leads people to separate themselves from their source and final end. This is, of course, substantively the same argument that McIntyre makes. One of the maladies of modernity is that our lives are no longer connected to the fulfillment of some higher end. Each of us should aim to elevate from man as he happens to be to man as he could be if he realized his essential nature. Without a purpose guiding our actions, we live in a world we live in the world of Nietzsche, where morality is just a front for our individual desires. This system is akin to a train moving forward without any sense as to where or why it is going in that direction. A Southern is also highly critical of the political and economic hegemony found in modern society. He states, for example, that democracy tightened the reins of power and influence for a new group of rulers that replaced earlier ones and adopted the same social role played by their predecessors but used a new style. In other words, a Southern is skeptical that liberal democratic societies really conduct their actions in accordance with the principles they verbally espouse. Whereas a scholar like an naim mentioned above, uh, believes that secularism is completely neutral, a Souther, believe, a Souther sees it as a cover for more nefarious ideologies. This is very similar to the view of McIntyre, who wrote that politically, the societies of advanced Western modernity are oligarchies disguised as liberal democracies. The large majority of those who inhabit them are excluded from membership, in the elites that determine the range of alternatives between which voters are permitted to choose.
and the most fundamental issues are excluded from the range of alternatives. Going one step further, McIntyre argues that modern politics is civil war carried on by other means. There is little to no concept of a shared common good. McIntyre was thinking in terms of domestic politics, at least in the examples he cited in his book, After Virtue. But a Souther was writing from a larger international relations perspective. His own experience as a resident of Iraq, which had experienced much destruction at the hands of various U.S.-backed regimes, i.e. regimes that had the support of a democratic country, demonstrated to him very clearly that human society lacks a shared conception of the good, largely because of how capitalism privileges the individual over society. Whether a Southern's critique is solved by his proposed solution, i.e. an Islamic state, which I'll discuss further, is a subject of wider debate, especially given the problems associated with the Islamic revolution that took place in Iran. The most striking part of As-Sadr's critique of capitalism is the following. He states that not only is the entire capitalistic system materialistic, but also it is lacking the courage to declare its being linked to it and based on it. In other words, As-Sadr is troubled by the fact that materialism has been internalized as a characteristic feature of capitalism and yet it has not been explicitly articulated or critically examined as a philosophy. If it had, then perhaps this system could be morally defensible, even if others disagreed with its principles and presuppositions. A Southern's critique is of course not entirely true, as there are thinkers who have spoken elegantly about the capitalist system, starting as early as Adam Smith in the 18th century. But as Southern's point is that people tend to view capitalism as the natural state of affairs that need not be challenged or understood further. And Naim is a perfect example of this tendency. He is one of the foremost scholars of Islamic law in the Western world. And yet, remarkably, he believes that we must accept current political and economic institutions as they are without giving a substantive defense for why that should be the case. As a result of this kind of perspective, society continues to become more deeply enmeshed with a system that is inherently corrosive for moral virtue. Excuse me one second. A Southern's next target of criticism is communism. Uh, and is actually also the impetus for the writing of his book. <clears throat> At one level, a Souther understands the appeal of communism, especially as a response to what he calls general social tyranny, which I take to mean life as we know it, which is unjust and governed by a small set of elites. He is also appreciative of the fact that communism is based on a specific materialistic philosophy which adopts a specific understanding of life. That is to say, unlike capitalism, communism is a well-thought-out system of life, and its theorists have laid out concrete steps for how to achieve their vision. Ultimately, however, a Southern sees communism as one, deficient in its approach, and two, solving for a problem that does not exist. <clears throat> he begins his critique by tackling the fundamental underpinning of Marxist theory, the replacing of private ownership with, with societal ownership. He states that communism does not work in practice because it is contradictory to the incentives of human nature. It would require a level of selfless selflessness on the part of the individual and a degree of commitment to society that is virtually impossible in practice. Individual feelings would have to be replaced by what he calls social feelings. This is especially impractical in a world where people have no concept of an afterlife, so they are motivated to accumulate material interests in the, in, in the immediate term. People would have to be programmed to sacrifice their personal interests and the material acquisitions of their limited lives 
for the sake of society and its interests. A Souther cites, for example, <clears throat> uh, the fact that the most important doctrine of communism, the abolition of private ownership, has never been fully implemented. This is an implicit recognition that it would not be possible to motivate people on such a basis. Thus, governments have taken a half measure by instead focusing on nationalizing industries. Therefore, in a nutshell, communism is not the solution we are looking for. He characterizes it as a system that sets out to, quote, destroy the individual in a society and make him an instrument to be manipulated for the purposes of realizing the general standards that this system presupposes, end quote. This is also an in, 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 sorry. <laughs> this is also an inherent contradiction in the philosophy that communism espouses, which is to ensure that individuals are no longer an instrument for other powerful actors. Furthermore, despite being impressed by the sophistication of the theory, a Souther is not convinced that private ownership is the cause for moral decline in society. He does not buy the notion that economic and social security are sufficient freedom for the individual. He views this as a perspective that is unduly burdened by the gaze of capitalistic democracy. <clears throat> in other words, in trying to solve for capitalism, a Souther believes that communists are providing solutions that are highly specific to it. What is missing instead is, quote, the value and rights of individual dignity, end quote. This is the problem that a Souther is interested in solving and which he turns his attention to in the next part of his work. So now we get to the most interesting part of his book, uh, which is when he assesses the actual problem at hand and puts forth a theory to address it. It is here that we see a Souther engage most closely with Aristotle's worldview. A Souther begins by noting that self-love is the most general and oldest uh, instinct we know. In a Souther's terminology, self-love is interchangeable with the term happiness from Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics. A Souther states that self-love is an intrinsic feature of human beings. They will want to increase happiness and decrease pain and misery. <clears throat> Recognizing this instinct for self-love is critical to understanding and designing human society. Building on this recognition, a Souther states, quote, Whether we wish to create any change in human behavior, we must first change the human notion of pleasure and benefit, and then place the behavior desi desired in the general frame of the instinct of self-love, end quote. In other words, we must cultivate virtue through habit, such that performing the desired behavior from a societal perspective becomes what the individual finds to be pleasurable. This is, as the reader or the audience will no doubt realize a theoretical framework drawn directly from Aristotle. For Aristotle, performing virtuous acts that become habits via repetition without any reference to a concept of heaven and hell was entirely possible. McIntyre, despite imploring us to care about tradition, similarly does not imply that lack of belief in an afterworld means that individuals would automatically resort to selfish behavior. A Souther goes one step further than Aristotle and McIntyre, however, in that the cultivation of virtue for him includes training citizens to take seriously the idea of a world beyond this world. For a Souther, the natural inclina inclination for materialistic behavior as evidenced by capitalist societies, is so strong that religion is necessary to act as a counterbalancing force. That is to say, if a person were to believe that there were nothing that there was nothing to strive for beyond this world, then self-love would naturally direct her to accumulate material wealth and power at the expense of all other goals. <clears throat> 
This is a fascinating extension of the Aristotelian framework, particularly because it is so pessimistic about the nature of humankind. It is distinct from McIntyre's reading of Athenian society, where individuals believed that their self-value came from their participation in the polis. For McIntyre, because social participation was so crucial, failing to uphold one's social role would in itself be considered a moral failure. As I will detail further, a Souther also sees societal contribution as integral to moral virtue. But his starting point is that individuals are naturally selfish and need a built-in corrective to modify their behavior, which for him is religion. McIntyre, on the other hand, would probably argue that it is modernity itself rather than an ingrained characteristic of humankind that has made us selfish. A Southern's proposed solution, which he frames as, quote, the proper treatment of the problem, end quote, is an Islamic system. The solution, in a Southern's words, is to develop people's materialistic notions of life. That is to say, people need to be properly trained to understand how to live, which Islam teaches. For a Southern, Islam radically redefines how life is understood. Excuse me. He engages in a rights-based discourse, whereby each individual is provided with spiritual and material dignity, in contradistinction to a society that caters to individual whims, i.e. capitalism, or uses the individual as a mechanical tool in the social system, i.e. communism. The Islamic system is superior because there is a new moral criterion by which humans are judged. That criterion, in a Southern's words, is the satisfaction of God. Thus, instead of measuring accomplishments in terms of the accumulation of wealth or the net benefit to society, individuals are instructed to act in accordance with what God desires. A Southern sees religion as a great unifier of the new moral criterion, i.e. the satisfaction of God and the principle of self-love that is inherent to human nature. <clears throat> Eschatology plays an important role in this perspective. Religion allows human beings to understand that one's efforts in this life results in one achieving happiness in the second life that is proportional to his efforts in this limit of limited life to attain God's satisfaction. Thus, two problems are solved at once. In abiding by the moral criterion, human beings are human beings achieve both personal and societal objectives in this world as they need to establish a just society in order to meet the criterion set by God. Linking natural self-interests with societal interests uh, is, in El Southern's view, not possible in an ungodly society. Because in a worldview where, in the words of Augustine, the earthly city is the be-all and the end-all, Individual interests will often be at odds with societal interests. A Southern's next reason for proposing an Islamic system is because of the moral education that would be inculcated upon the citizen, cit citizenry. A Southern was not proposing a concept of education in the Socratic sense. That is to say, Southern did not believe that the root of all vices is ignorance and that once people are taught the correct way, they will change their behavior. Rather, he believed that spiritual inclinations and their dispositions need to be cultivated. Otherwise, man will naturally gravitate toward material wants and vices. This focus on spirituality is a distinction that is not made by Aristotle or McIntyre. Certainly, Aristotle did not believe that only spiritual virtues need to be cultivated. His theory of the mean applies to all areas of life. What would such an education look like? A Southern states that the infallible leadership provided by God gives humans sufficient instruction for such an education. This is, of course, somewhat of a fiction in that the education provided by God requires intermediaries in the form of human beings. And this is where most of the differences and conflicts are, 
that arise in the world come from. But anything beyond this is left unsaid in his book, and probably for good reason, as it is difficult to imagine that there would be any consensus on such a system. But perhaps what a Sadr had in mind was the educational system that he advocated within the Shi'i seminary. He found his own clerical training to be outdated, as it engaged little with modern subjects. For this reason, he proposed reforms so that clerical students were exposed to a wider variety of subjects and were required to undergo university-style coursework and examinations in conjunction with their theological training. Based on his views discussed thus far and the educational reforms he proposed, one can reasonably hypothesize that, he, that his ideal educational model would be a mix of secular and religious subjects, as well as a practical component to translate theory into action. Ultimately, a seller believes an Islamic state is the best way forward because it makes certain moral values become desirable to people. As a result, the very nature of self-love dictates the pursuit of desirable moral values. McIntyre's proposed resolution of the modern condition is different in the details, but conceptually very similar. McIntyre, like us Sadr, believes that the modern capitalistic system must be tackled head-on and fundamentally disrupted. Both thinkers also find some merit in the communist system, although a Sadr is more for forceful in his assessment of its limitations. McIntyre ends his book by stating that we are waiting for another Saint Benedict, a Catholic saint who is considered the founder of Western monasticism. What a Sadr leaves unsaid, but is doubtless at the forefront of his mind, is that the Islamic world is also waiting for such a saint. His name, of course, is, is Imam Mahdi, uh, a figure in Shi'i theology who is believed to have been in hiding for over 1,100 years and will return at the end of days in conjunction with Jesus to restore justice on earth. So, Four centuries before the advent of Islam, a Christian author from North Africa asked, What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? I end this talk by similarly asking, What does Athens have to do with Najaf? The answer, it seems, is quite a bit. Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr, one of the most well-respected modern philosophers of the Islamic world, is unfortunately virtually unknown in the West. Yet engagement with his works shows that this is a tremendous loss for Western philosophy. A Southern is fluent in the language and discourses of the West and has much to say about how to address the state of disorder in modern morality. In this paper, I have tried to juxtapose the views of Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr with those of Alistair McIntyre, as both thinkers provide us with new ways of approaching morality through engagement with the Aristotelian tradition of virtue ethics. Ultimately, their views diverge in that al-Sadr sees religion, and more specifically, a modern state governed by religious values, as the best way to solve for the materialism that is endemic to our society. Whereas McIntyre advocates the creation of independent communities which disavow modern political institutions as much as possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, we have quite a bit of time for some, for some uh, uh, I can get a sense of um,